Oh, hey, it's Tiki Technical Tuesday. If you watched the last episode, you might be thinking that these freshly poured molds are for the porcelain pounder mug that we sculpted in the previous episode. Actually, it's not. This is for yet another new mug that I sculpted and I am in love with. I was going to wait and release this episode after I showed you how I cast the porcelain pounders, but quite frankly, I just want to share this sculpture. I'm so happy with the way it turned out because it involves three of my favorite things. What are those three things? Well, traditional American jugs, zombies, and faces. We're gonna mix all of those together into one piece. And that is the goal for this new mug. We are going to take a traditional American stoneware jug, the way that fluids and whiskey and spirits and molasses and mercury and anything liquid was transported around the country until like 1900 uh, in these stoneware jugs. Also wooden barrels, but it was barrels in these. This is what they used. This was the way fluids were moved. Uh, we are also going to put a face on it, which people have been doing since the Middle Ages, but it's also a uniquely American art form, the folk art face jug. I love them. And lastly, we're gonna put a zombie on it because zombies, you know, we've got the zombie uh, cocktail and just zombies are fabulous. I'd love to make a bookend piece to this zombie mug I did several years ago. Now, this is not the first time I've done this. I made a hand-built mug. Let me get a picture of it. Years ago, I did a hand-built zombie uh, jug. I called this the shrunken uh, head shrinking bitters, head shrinking bitters jug. I did this for Tiki Oasis years back and I loved it and it was hand built. So it's a one of a kind. So it sold and then it was gone forever and I never got to see it again. Um, we had the zombie's face stretched over a traditional, uh, you know, stoneware jug. And I've always wanted to make another one. I thought it would be cool if I could make a slip cast one so that um, not only could I have one for myself, but uh, we could sell many of them and lots of people could have one in their house. And I wanted to make a little bigger. Um, so perhaps you could batch up uh, like a bunch of zombie cocktails to serve at a party or amongst your friends, fill up the jug and then dispense zombies throughout the party for your friends. That's the goal, that's the plan, let's get started. As always, a sculpture starts out with an armature that's like a skeleton that holds the clay up while you're sculpting it. And I like to make my armatures with our laser cutter because, well, it's a lot of fun. I designed the armature and the template in Adobe Illustrator, sent them up to the cloud, and had Mrs. Van Tiki cut them with what I thought was 3mm plywood. Spoiler, it isn't. It's a, it's a little fatter than that. So I actually had to do a lot of sanding on these pieces. And I mean... A lot. I could have probably just recut them, but uh, anyway, we're just going to spare you the sanding and cut to the finished bit. Okay, after like an hour of sanding, during which time I could have easily just probably adjusted the file and cut a new one. I didn't do that, partly because I was being stubborn and frustrated, and also partly because I just didn't want to waste the materials. It's a perfect cut, um, other than my slight mismeasurement or lack of measurement. So anyway, we sanded it. Check this out. Perfect. Oh, look at that. I think we're just about ready for clay. I need to attach this to some sort of board and we're good to go. Woo. All right, at this point in the process, I kind of go down a cataclysmic series of measurement errors. Uh, it started with that first jig and armature that I made. It looks great, but I didn't take into consideration the shrinkage. The clay is going to shrink like 10%, and so I need to make it a little bigger. So I decided to bump up the PVC pipe size to a 4-inch pipe. Unfortunately, I somehow switched from inches to centimeters in the process, and I ran off looking for a 5-inch pipe, which is a really weird size pipe, and it's a lot bigger than I really need. And I'm at an electronics store. Well, like not not like a like a home electronics, like an actual like electrical 
wiring and pipe and stuff like that uh, for like building because it turns out five inches of PVC, the five inch diameter is a really rare diameter and it's mostly used for pressurized pipe and for running conduit in buildings. So fortunately we live in a big city and we have a uh, like an electrical supplier here. Mrs. Van Tiki saved the day by remembering that this place is in Eugene. So here I am and it just so happens that they have the five inch pipe. Thank God. All right, I'm back at a different hardware store with the proper size pipe. This is a true four inch diameter PVC, well, this is, I guess ABS, it's black. I was hoping they have the white one, they didn't, they only have the black. It doesn't matter, you know, we're gonna cast it, but I, I just would have liked the white. It would have looked more like the actual finished piece. But at any rate, this is the proper diameter that I was looking for. I completely thought I did that first model on a four inch pipe. Just sometimes you just don't realize you have a measurement wrong and, uh, it means you have to drive all around town to a whole bunch of different hardware stores. So I will be returning the large pipe and I'm gonna to try to make a new armature with this pipe. Okay, I have just redone all of the armature and template parts. Hopefully I have got things measured correctly this time. I, I might not, I, I'm definitely not perfect as I have just proven, um, but hopefully this works. And I double checked the thickness of the material this time. Actually, Mrs. Van Dyke did for me. Uh, so hopefully I have all these notches sized correctly for the wood that she will be cutting these parts out of. I'm sending these to the cloud right now and uh, Mrs. Van Dyke will cut them because I don't know how to use the laser. Okie dokie, I am back in the studio. It is Monday and last weekend was TikiCon! It was the very last TikiCon. This is the Pacific Northwest Tiki Convention. I have been honored to have been part of this show for the past eight years, and it was it was an incredible weekend. It was very sad knowing that it was the last one, but it was such a wonderful celebration. Um, we gave a symposium. I talked about um, I talked about crafting these uh, some porcelain pendants. Folks turned out for the symposium. It was a filled room and people, uh, lots of people shared that they really enjoyed seeing the symposium. They felt like they learned a lot about ceramics. And let me just tell you, it just, it made me so happy to just, to just see everybody there, to see so much art, to see so much just joy. It was, it was a fantastic weekend, but it's time to get back to work. And we are going to get back onto this jug. Now, this is the first jug that we made. Uh, <laughs> Too small. This is what we're gonna be going with. And I want to get a face onto this. And before I go ahead and sculpt this top section, this nice domed section, which we made the jig for, I want to make sure that I'm gonna be able to put the face on. Now, this is a scale printout that I've done. Uh, here we have it. I've done everything in scale, calculating for shrinkage. And it's giving you an idea of where this face is going to sit on the jug. Now, this is a rigid pipe. And I actually want the eyes to be set in a little bit. So I'm going to mark this pipe and cut out a bit of a channel in here because I want to inset the eye sockets. Uh, just because, you know, just like a skull, if you feel your own face, there's going to be, it goes in right there. So I'm going to make sure that I can go in right there so I'm not knocking against this hard plastic when I'm trying to sculpt the model. The danger is I don't want to remove too much, but I don't want to remove too little because the last thing I want to do when I'm sculpting with the clay is bunk run into the armature. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna do that first, then we're gonna do the round top, and then we're gonna make the face. First things first, I uh, carefully plotted out the areas of the skull or the, the jug or the head or whatever we're gonna call it that I needed to be recessed. And that's basically the eye socket zone. And I want to have the cheeks kind of sunken in too. So I transferred that to the PVC pipe, marked it out well, and then just went at it with the drill, drilling about uh, six million little holes all around the perimeter of the area that I wanted to remove. After that, I uh, pulled that section out and smoothed things out using a rotary grinder tool. All right, I got the kiln vent going, so sorry about the audio. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I believe we are just about ready to get into the nitty gritty of clay. As you can see, I have roughed out this opening. I sure hope it's big enough. If not, we will be attacking this later with a file or whatever we can get in there with without destroying whatever sculpture I've already got started. Hopefully there is not some graphic happening over this saying, ho, oh, ho, ho, you didn't make a big enough hole. I don't know, we'll see. At any rate, this is what we're at. Now, I don't want to fill up this entire space with clay. That would be a little ridiculous. I only want the clay to be on the front. So I will be packing this void in with a little bit of uh, aluminum foil, kind of balled up aluminum foil. It fills spaces up nicely, and it's easy to kind of 
push back. If I, if I have it sticking out too far, it's easy for me to reach into the tool and kind of pack it back in and then fill that space out with clay. Um, at least that is the plan. So I'm gonna fill this up with some aluminum foil. The clay is softening nicely. And then I believe I will tackle doing the dome top first and then we will start getting the face in place. So excited. If you watched the previous video in Tiki Technical Tuesday, you saw how I used a template very similar to this one to make the porcelain pounder mug. Uh, these are great when you're doing a rounded uh, kind of cylindrical form to get a nice profile. Um, it's just really a fast way to block out a general geometric form. Once the top was done, it was time to just kind of roughly fill in the void on the interior of the jug. Now, if you're wondering where that uh, fancy little tabletop stand comes from, I'm putting a link to it in the uh, description of the video. I love that stand. All right, so while the clay that we put on the armature is cooling and I am warming up some more clay to put onto that armature, thinking about eyeballs, um, I have a variety of eye shapes here. I like to use glass spheres if I can, and by glass spheres I mean marbles, because I'm not gonna bump them or nick them with tools, and they won't swell or absorb alcohol throughout the sculpting process like wooden balls will. Um, I have these which look, I have, well, I have one that is close to the size that I need. These marbles are too big. I think that these are the eyes that I use for the little Lammy mug, and those are a bit large for the eye that I'm looking for. This looks pretty good, but it's made out of wood. Now, I would love to go to the toy store. Eugene Toy and Hobby, I love you, but it's 4th of July weekend and everything is closed. And I really wanna get this going. So I am hesitant to use the wood. It has a little bit of a flat spot here. I can just make out the wood grain and I am really worried about this thing swelling up if I'm spritzing this with alcohol or putting mold release on it and uh, having a rough surface. So I think I'm going to try a trick that I did way back in the special effects days, eons ago. Uh, and that's, I'm gonna try to make some epoxy eyes. I'm gonna use an epoxy clay that I have. Um, and I have some that sets extremely fast. So I'm gonna see if I can use my uh, freeform air fast setting to make some eye spheres. I don't know how smooth they're gonna be, but we're gonna give it a try. So I'm gonna be using a two-part epoxy putty. And you see that I'm uh, taking part A and part B, you mix them evenly together, and I'm just taking two equally sized bits and just rolling them together, kneading them in my hand like, I don't know, like Play-Doh, uh, until they're a uniform color, and then I just set them aside to cure. Uh, you can use alcohol or water, it might even be better to get a nice smooth surface on this while you are working with it. Okay, well that was a pretty good first try. Um, this first one is fantastic. It's got a great surface on it, but I think it's a little, just a hair too big. The second one kicked off faster than I expected and the surface got just destroyed. It's a little lumpy, but this one will work great for the closed eyeball. These things are incredibly hot. They are an exothermic reaction, meaning they kick off heat when the uh, chemical reaction happens that hardens the epoxy in these. Um, these are extremely lightweight. They are a blend of epoxy, a two-part epoxy, and a bunch of um, glass micro balloons, which give it a lot of light weight. Uh, but yeah, this, this one looks great. I'm not even gonna touch this one because I don't wanna dent the surface. I'm gonna try making one more to see if I can get one close to that size and as shiny as that. And then I think we will have the eyeballs that we'll use in the sculpture. Yay, DIY. If you're wondering why I have this freeform air, it's kind of leftovers from when I was doing the um, Let's see, first I got it when I made the mold for the Dead Eye mug a way long time ago. And then I bought a bunch more to make the Fireball Island game. This is what I sculpted the majority of the Fireball Island game. The Freeform Air Standard takes a long time to cure. Uh, I mean, a very long time, like many, many hours. It takes overnight to cure. Whereas this fast stuff takes, as you can see, about five minutes to, to kick off. And something to know about that exothermic reaction, um, it's a compounding exothermic reaction, meaning the thicker the more mass, the thicker the, the chunk of epoxy you have, that heat will generate more and more heat and it'll, it'll cure very quickly. It can, it can, in fact, it can get quite hot. They don't recommend going past a certain thickness. I can't remember how many inches because it can actually get to a very, very high temperature and can like burn you. So you have to be really careful about it. Whoa, geez, don't get it too thick. Ah. Focus, focusing. Okay, look at these eyeballs. So happy with them. The second one, I actually used water instead of alcohol in the last step as it was uh, to keep it from sticking to my hands and it worked extremely well. 
I'm going to let these set uh, probably overnight, although they will be very firm in about an hour. They do say it takes a... Uh, Let's shorten this with an edit while I read this. It just says, it says hard in 45 minutes. So I guess I don't need to let this sit overnight, but I'm definitely letting it sit for an hour or so while we finish up the top of the jug. I'd love to use one of these little rubber tipped tools. I think painters use these, sculptors use these, they're great. Uh, they're just nice for uh, squishing soft clay into little voids and smoothing out surfaces. Alrighty, folks, we are doing it. We are going to start blocking this sculpture out. What do I mean by that? We are just putting in the very rough shapes, the cornerstones of the face, the anatomy. We've got cheekbones in there. We've got the nasal bridge. We're going to put some teeth and some chins. We're just worried about proportion right now and making sure everything is in the right place. Uh, I'm figuring out how far back I want the ears to go, and you're going to see I'm even going to go in and sketch out my planned lashing on the back. I would like to use some leather straps and actually have this face lashed to the front of this jug. So thoughts while I'm uh, blocking this out. We've been watching The Bear on uh, Hulu, I think it's on. I don't know. You know, if, you, if you're watching, you know what it is. It's a, it's a show about people starting a restaurant. And it was funny. Uh, I see some parallels between that show and... It reminds me of back when I used to work in a special effects shop, um, especially when uh, one of the characters in the show was talking about uh, getting that uh, Michelin star and what you have to do to get that star, that you have to give up everything, that you've got to devote everything to it. And um, I do know a lot of effects artists that I worked with back in the day that would focus everything on, I don't know if it was just getting an Oscar, but I definitely think it was on being the best that you can be. There's something about these creative industries where people are just driven to be so creative. And I remember, Specifically with eyeballs, I was working with an artist named Rob Henderstein. This was on, man, I can't remember. This may have been from Dust Till Dawn. I can't remember. Rob did several uh, shows with us when I was at KMB Effects Group. But Rob Henderstein was making eyeballs. He uh, made eyeballs completely round like this. His eyeballs are beautiful. He did the eyes on Jurassic Park. He's an incredible artist. And Bill Hunt, who was a sculptor at the studio at the time, he later went on to be the lead sculptor at uh, Weta for the Lord of the Rings films. Um, he was upset that there was not a corneal bulge on the eye forms. I didn't even know this existed. Right where your cornea is on the eye, there's actually like a dome over your cornea, and it catches light differently when light hits the eye. It's not just a completely smooth sphere. Uh, and Bill was insistent that they should have those they got into a big heated argument. At the time, I was like, you guys are crazy. But now I understand uh, Bill's commitment to realism and putting everything he could into the piece. That being said, we're just roughing this out right now. I am not worried about much, just general shapes, just getting the rough anatomy in there. And I just went to the drawer and got some of my heavy hitters. These are the um, ZM tools, they're hook rakes. And I also got a, um, this is a uh, like a rake tool made out of a, uh, uh, like a jeweler saw that we sanded the tips down. This is made by Ken's Tools. These are ZM Tools. I'll put links to all these. But these are my roughing out tools. As you can see, they're big, they're aggressive, they leave a lot of marks on the clay. But this is what we're going to hit with after we block everything out with just our fingers. Oh my god, and it is so hot in here right now. 86 in the studio. Ooh. Now, every time I do a sculpting video, I am tempted to cut out a lot of these time lapses because I'm worried you're all going to get too bored watching it. But then in the comments, you all come in and say, we could watch you do this forever. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of both. I'm not going to put all of the footage in here, but I'm going to put a lot of the footage in here of me blocking out this face. Now, as you can see, we're in a very rough, rough, rough state. I am just working on anatomy and balance. Uh, it's really critical that you get all of that kind of stuff figured out before you jump into detailing. I see a lot of sculptors go in and they'll block out a face and then just jump on making like the perfect eye when you still got to figure everything out. Now, it does look like I'm dialing in the teeth right now, but I'm only doing this because they're going to be under the lips. So I got to get this kind of figured out now before I add lips over the top. Things change when you're blocking out your sculpture. For example, I decided that the eyes were protruding too far from the eye sockets, so I gotta kind of get in here, work them out, carve out some clay from behind the eyes, and then set them back into the skull. Now, this I thought looked a lot better overall. So, I mean, that's the whole thing. Blocking out a sculpture is your time to just do like a rough sketch, but in clay. Okay, here is the finished rough sketch. I've got the thing blocked out. I like where all the anatomy is sitting. 
and it's time for me to start filling in all these gaps and actually making this look like skin and flesh and zombie wonder. Hey, good morning. I am out doing my Sunday long run and I just thought that I would share that usually all I think about when I'm running is mugs and mold making. And this morning, all I've been thinking about is I've been sculpting the mug in my head, thinking about the mold and how I want to do the parting lines in the mold. And I like to put, whew, sorry, I like to put a lot of thought into this before I get into the sculpture because it's important. I don't want to sculpt myself into a corner where I'll have trouble molding it in the future. And you know, it's just good to think ahead. And it gives me something to think about while I'm out here. Whew. Okie dokie, we are about to dive into day two on the sculpting. And as always, when you step away from a sculpture for a while and then come back to it, you immediately see things that you want to change. So right off the bat, I'm like, I got to push these ears way back. I want to really exaggerate the fact that this is kind of zombie skin stretched over this stoneware jug. So I'm going to exaggerate the ears, pull them way back, uh, have them, you know, pulling almost, maybe I'll push them back even farther. I think that'll really help. I want to do a lot more fleshing out of the face. I'm really excited about diving in today. And I just got back from buying this a mirror. I looked all through my sculpting drawers yesterday. I used to have a little mirror that I use for reference and I couldn't find it. So today I got a great big mirror, which is fantastic. So I can make faces into this. I can squish and pull my lips and see how wrinkles happen. It's just a fantastic reference, uh, better than any photos, uh, at least for extreme expressions. I feel like I can really push it and just, you know, mirror it. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's get started. One thing that can kind of play with your brain as you move from the blocking it out stage to the more detailing and refining stages is it takes a lot longer. Blocking out goes really fast, uh, but the more and more you finesse and detail and get to that final surface, it just takes longer and longer and longer. And sometimes it can feel like it is just taking forever. You can see I'm slowly progressing from my fingers as a tool to using a, like this kind of spatula to smooth the clay out. And then from there, I go to the large S-shaped rake tools uh, to smooth out that surface and figure out all my surface planes. Uh, that's kind of the, the format of this. You start with your most clumsy tool, your fingers, and move on from there. Okay, so I mentioned on my long run the other day that I was thinking about how I was going to make a mold of this piece. And... Um, I did think about how I would do this top section. I, that was my big idea on the run, that I would do this as a unified piece that would lift up. And I was thinking about how I would want to put the well on the top, but we'll cover all that when we get to the mold making thing. Now, the one thing I am wrestling with is the nose and whether or not I'm going to go with this style where I had it on my uh, zombie lobotomy mug uh, with no nose, which I will tell you, A, is very zombie-like and B, it is an awful lot easier to mold and avoid undercuts on when you have like the these like you know the nasal lobes it's very difficult to do those without undercuts i don't know where i want to go i in the initial part of the sculpture i had a, like no nose on this like a like a zombie without a nose and i thought it looked pretty cool i'm probably gonna go back and forth i'm gonna continue refining the mouth get all of these extra planes done in here i really like the ears stressed farther back like this that's looking cool um yeah, I mean, it's, it's looking great as we tighten it up, and that's when I have to make kind of big decisions, like the nose. But we'll get to that. I'll, I'll work on the eyes first, finish up the eyes, finish up this side of the face, and then we will get to that pesky nose. I really want to push the expression of this mug, and I'm going to do that by putting some very exaggerated eyebrow shapes on it. I want it to look as if it was sitting there uh, like a dead zombie face on this jug, and the second you glanced over at the jug, bink, that eyeball pops open. At least that's my goal for this sculpture, uh, and hopefully we can pull it off. A quick way to kind of smooth out your rake tool marks and just see where you're at form-wise is hitting the whole sculpture with a Scotch-Brite pad like you used to do your dishes, and then very carefully with a torch. At this point, I should address my schedule and timing. Now, I would love to spend as much time as I possibly 
possibly could need to get this sculpture done, but I just can't do that. I am a professional artist, and of course, I've got schedules and bills and all that nonsense. And I've also got an upcoming vacation. Yes, we're going on vacation, and the plan was to get this mug sculpture done before we left. Now, that plan went right out the window when I bought the wrong size PVC pipe and ended up spending so much time making that armature. So I know I'm going to have to break this sculpture into two halves. Uh, what I can get done before we hop in a car and go to Yellowstone and what I can get done after. Ah, ears are such crazy uh, forms, but man, they do make a difference. Uh, this is looking so much cooler having the actual ear in place. Um, but now I've just got to figure out where I want to put it. And now I'm kind of rethinking how uh, I think earlier I was saying, you know, oh, I can, I can have the ropes attached to the ear. But now I think it might still be cooler to do it off of some attachment points here. Oh, this is such a difficult decision because I know that, um, well, I'm going to have to deal with whatever decision I make when it comes time to poke these holes into the castings and tie the ropes on there. Whoa, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, let me just place the ears and then we'll see what we have time for because it's getting close to lunch, which means stopping time and packing for road trip. Well, uh, Mrs. Vantiki just pulled up with lunch. That means we're stopping. We're stopping here. I got one ear on, and I'm thinking about maybe putting, like, like having the lobe a bit off on this other one. We'll see. I don't know. I will mull it over on our road trip, and I will hop back on this in about a week. Although, for you guys, it'll be quick. Hey, so, as you may have guessed, we're at Yellowstone. And am I thinking about the mug all the time? kind of am. I've actually like made a list of things I want to change or address as soon as I get home uh, on the sculpture. And it's, I think, I mean, maybe it's obsessive of me. I don't know, but it's just nice to kind of step away from the sculpture and just kind of work on it in my head for a while instead of, you know, staring at it in clay in the studio. Whew. Did you know that uh, Yellowstone is at like 8,000 foot elevation? Oh, you really can feel it. Okay, well, I'll catch up with you back at the studio, um, and hopefully I'll be able to address all these changes I'm making up. And we're back in the studio. Vacation is over. I am recharged and ready to dive back into the jug. Now, I do have that list of things that I've been slowly compiling over the vacation that I want to address and change on the face. But I gotta tell you, it feels so good to come back and look at it with fresh eyes. I'm really happy with it. Uh, so what we're going to do mainly is I'm going to increase the four, the uh, like the forehead bulge right here, and just the bridge of the nose right here. Uh, if you look at a skull, skulls have a nice little bump right here, which you know you can see, and it kind of just kind of triangulates the whole forehead space. Um, I think it's going to help a lot, especially right here inside of the nose. Uh, we're going to do that. We're going to tighten up some ears. I'm just so happy to get back onto this. So I am completely recharged in vacation, and I am hitting this with the gas pedal firmly down. We are making all of the changes that I had, and then we are going in and refining all of the final itty-bitty technical stuff. You can see I've got my close-up goggles on because this is very close-up work. We're worried about the tiny, littlest, littlest details here. After I go in and detail an area, I will hit it with the scotch Bright pad, and then we will very, very carefully go back with a torch to just kind of smooth the surface over before the next like wave or run of detailing. Now, these teeth were a bit of a nightmare. I wanted them to look as cool as possible. I wanted a lot of really deep details, but I also have to be very careful about undercuts. So I'm going in here and filling in all the little gaps and voids and also uh, just kind of trying to figure out in my head how we're going to make a mold of this thing. As we get into the home stretch, I've got to think about surface detail and what kind of texture I want on this skin. Now this is like an old dead skin face thing. So I don't want the surface to be super smooth. I want it to be a little gnarly. Uh, so I'm going in with a, this kind of, I'm, and I'm nailing it with a brush. This is kind of a, a technique to use to just kind of really help smooth out and round out any tool marks. And then I'm going back and uh, using a, like a plastic sheet and pushing in some simple uh, pore patterns for uh, pores and rotted bits and God knows what else. Um, again, this is all going to be covered with a layer of glaze, so I'm not too too worried about over-exaggerating things because uh, you're going to be looking at the surface texture through a thin layer of glass, basically. 
Okie dokie, it is five o'clock and I'm calling it. I love the texture on the face. It looks super cool. Now, will all this texture show up through the glaze? Probably not, but depending on what combination of glaze and underglaze I end up doing, I think it's gonna work out pretty well. And it's a great contrast between the smooth kind of jug surface, you know, the machined, well, I guess it's not machined, but the thrown jug surface, uh, and then versus like the skin of the zombie. So yeah, really happy. So am I done completely? Like I said, I'm not done completely. We still got to do the handle here. Uh, I started smoothing out the top section. I want to just clean up this little itty bitty bit on the tippy top. And then we're ready to make a mold. Oh my God. And this is going to be the mold of molds. I am kind of freaked out about it. So there you have it. Like I said, um, I wasn't planning on releasing this until uh, like a couple episodes down the road, so I didn't even shoot a proper outro to it. So consider this your improvised conclusion to the video. Uh, if you've enjoyed watching the sculpting process, I will put another link here to some other sculpting videos and maybe some other video I think you might enjoy. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you on the next Tiki Technical Tuesday.